questions. Um, this is Colleen Flanagan. Uh, it, she is a socio-ecologist artist with degrees in design and metals. She will share about her transdisciplinary collaborative work in coral reef restoration, uniting art, science, education, and technology in Cozumel, Mexico, and her investigation at UC Santa Cruz to determine how we can pro provide aesthetic and functional habitat to help revive our dying coral reef ecosystem. Please welcome Colleen. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for showing up today. Is this sound OK? It sounds really booming to me. It sounds OK to you. OK, cool. Well, so yes, I'm Colleen Flanagan. My organization is Living Sea Sculpture. And as she just said perfectly what I do, I'm going to share a little bit of a trajectory of how I went from being um, an artist designer making more mixed media and jewelry work into working with coral reefs. So, oh, and I wanted to mention that I, did you guys see Julie Packard's talk today, some of you? When she mentioned 1984, the opening of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I remember being there as a, as a um, field trip with my school. And I realized that how fortunate I was to have that time to absorb all this important ocean information that started to come out in my artwork. This is a barnacle ring. And I worked for many years in stop motion animation, making the skeletons and armatures for the, for the puppets. So this is actually a ball and socket skeletal structure that is what brings to life the puppets in those types of films and shows. I worked to make sculptures out of welded steel for children to weave wire in to flesh out their forms in museums and schools. And all of this work, you'll see some of how it relates to the, the reef work I'm going to show in a minute. But whoops. I was making jewelry. And these earrings actually look a lot like coral polyps. And I didn realize that over 20 years ago that these types of ideas were coming out. These are cast silver broccoli. And this particular cauliflower, it's a, it's a detail of a larger piece called Hunter Gardener. And that cauliflower is made from a living cauliflower with an electrified paint over it that then it's a conductive paint. And then through electrolysis, you can plate it. So it's called electroforming. And this process is exactly related to the methods we're using for coral reef restoration that I'll be sharing. And thematically, I was also very um, impacted by the crisis of our times, uh, the climate, the planet, and how humans keep conquering all of our wildlife. So in this work conquest, I was spinning dog hair, human hair, cat hair into yarn, and then wrapping it around these, these chicken wire forms. Some of them are like the extinct species on the walls, kind of disappearing in ghostly forms. And this cat-headed, winged, a female is flying towards a beaker of water, our most precious resource. So with that, I somehow landed in working with electrolysis through seawater to help create electrified reefs and habitats. The process, in a nutshell, is you run low volt direct current through seawater, and that causes the natural limestone minerals like calcium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide that are naturally occurring in the sea to deposit and build up onto this metal structure. And then the idea is that corals can attach to it. And oh, this is for the test afterwards. I expect all of you to memorize the chemical equation. Or just remember this photo. Because this is a piece in Bali showing a project that was made by this, designed by the inventor of the process. Um, it's called BioRock. And Wolf Hilberts, the architect and professor who I learned from, he designed this piece that now is being you know, reappropriated by life and lots of fish and corals. So as she mentioned, I'm going to talk about Mexico and UC Santa Cruz, taking you to Mexico right now down to the Yucatan Peninsula. That's Cancun. 
and to the second largest barrier reef in the world, which is the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. It's almost 600 miles long, running from Isla Contoy, just above Cancun, down into Honduras. And it's an incredibly valuable system that is really suffering badly right now. This is from 2014. I was snorkeling right off the coast. The reefs look healthy there that day. That center orange piece is a Elkhorn coral, highly endangered, highly important and critical to our, our reef building species because they help to slow the waves. They bring in lots of um, shore protection, obviously, which we need more than ever. And yeah, right now when I was just last snorkeling in this kind of area, it's just a lot of grayness going on. Which brings me to what is a coral reef anyway? It's made out of thousands of little polyps, animals, side by side. Each of those little guys with their tentacles is an individual organism that are all um, living and breathing in harmony. And they, where you see the white tips, that shows that they're growing, they're healthy, and the color within them is caused by zooxanthellae, which is a symbiotic algae that provides 90% of their food and their um, their livelihood <laughs> through photosynthesis. And then at night, the polyps are also eating. So they have this great relationship until we have spikes in temperature and that can cause the bleaching, which you're all familiar with. Um, one centigrade degree too hot for a month can cause them to eject their symbiotic algae and start to get crumbly and starve and die. Um, another huge impacting problem is unsustainable fishing for the reefs. This is like dynamite fishing throw a bomb 30 to 100 feet gets blasted just for five, six pounds of fish, $10 of food. And so the economic systemic problems around the world are also a critical factor. This is a happy moment where they were transplanting out those different staghorn corals and looking pretty good. But in the past five years, this disease has come from Florida. I mean, it's not Florida's fault, but it has arrived. It started in Florida that they knew and it's now arrived in Cozumel and the Yucatan Peninsula has 22 species with this terrible bacteria that in weeks to months you'll lose just giant meters worth of 22 species, which I think I just said. Antibiotic paste, they're trying that, but as we all know, like, what does that do in the long run? Shouldn't we have water treatment plants, maybe? And for those of us who love beauty, because obviously the coral reefs are our master artists of all time and architects, and we should respect that, but sometimes it takes policymakers and governments to really look at the money and the lives saved. And Carl Storlazzi of USGS put this together to really help um, put some heft behind getting the funding that's required. You can see at the bottom that coral reefs are a first line of defense, 18,000 people, and that number is so big, a billion, 805 million close to my annual income is um, what is um, being saved annually by reefs. They reduce shore, um, the wave, their attenuators of waves by like 70%. And so that's kind of a big deal. So you see a clear cut, you're gonna plant a tree, I hope, and then you see a dynamite bomb and you're going to plant some coral. My, now I bring you to the more creative side. I was so inspired by being able to use my metal smithing and artistic skills to actually help life recover. I designed this rough sketch of a DNA molecule or two helices coming together. And then we made the project to put it in Mexico. Thanks to lots of Kickstarter backers and private funders I was able to bring a team down and work with the locals as well to design this project. And then some things happened and it became a memorial project named Zoe, a living sea sculpture in honor of Zoe Anderson. And Zoe means life. And I'll let you all read that beautiful quote by his, her, his, her father. And because of the inclusion of making a memorial, memorial project, we added a live streaming underwater web camera. So you can watch it live streaming 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, sometimes at night when the light works. And this camera rotates around. You can set tours. 
here it is just to share what the project, what Zoe looked like as a spindly little rebar piece. Those are reef balls and other explorative laboratory restoration projects happening in the area. A huge hurricane hit in 2005, so that's part of, along with all the tourism, millions of tourists come there every year. Here's Zoe, just after a couple weeks with the electricity, you can see the minerals frosting over the surface. And up in the far corner, you can see that, which is where the electrification, the cable, is attached. And many of you wonder, like, well, where's the electricity coming from? It would be great, it could come from solar, it can come from wind, wave. In this case, it's coming from that dive shop, Sand Dollar Sports who is providing the power. It takes about a laptop of power to, to, to do this kind of piece. And here you can see it's right in between a lot of cruise ships. So with the millions of tourists coming, we're up against a huge impact of pollution and sedimentation. And so, and so uh, this is what it looks like around here. There are pretty moments too. This is just, so you get an idea of the lay of the land. When designing reefs and reefscapes, it's important to think of what do all the organisms need, not just I'm creating a nursery, if you're thinking really of ecosystem rehabilitation. And these types of reef balls are great for fish aggregation. The fish have a lot of these desert spaces, so I'm looking into different methods for how to help give them structure again. And just, these are the different busts in the area. I don't know why I'm sharing all these, but I just wanted you to get an idea for the place, that it's a museum as well. And these are super, um, these are the, the ocean heroes, and Zoe's part of this underwater museum as well. Now I wanna show you a little something about, these are Lemuel and Miranda, two great volunteers, and this is what you get to see with the live streaming camera couple screenshots from 2017, and then my sister captured that just a year later or so, and you could see how much the minerals have grown. Oops, went too fast. I love this, uh, David Larian captured this highlight of puffer fish. They're the best. And take note of that fan flagging up at the top because I'm going to talk about that fan coral in a second too. So just a, a shot of how little life was on it in 2017, but it was bringing fish and other organisms right away because they just want sometimes a structure. And those of you, many people ask me, does it need the electricity? Can you turn off the electricity? Well, you can, but one of the benefits or claims is that while the electricity is running, that it gives the corals a boost to grow faster, to survive some environmental stress. And that's something we're really curious to see here. And we don't want to turn it off because if it really does give them a boost during a bleaching spike, then they would all bleach. And this was a, a test. It turns out we chipped away a little of the minerals hoping to just watch it grow back, but at the very same time, the cable was cut to the power. So for four months, there was no power. So you can see just what happens. And then when the power came back on, you can see it's like, they say it's like self-healing or repairing, but it's just the minerals start to deposit again, which is great when you, we've had a, a, a storm hit pretty bad and chip off some, and then it at least re, refixes itself. Here's another before and after. Is anyone aware of the time, though, too? Because I'm afraid I could talk forever. OK. Um, <clears throat> the picture, you can see, wow, life is happening. The picture on the right, I have a really strong fondness for that Parides coral. And one day, when I was out diving with Daphna Bimstein, an amazing volunteer, we noticed it had been probably kicked by a snuba or a snorkel or diver just accidentally, because it's, it's only 12, 15 feet deep. People are out there, hundreds of people. And so, so I, that day, a dear friend of mine, Suleiman Bakit, had died, and he was on my mind. And so I found the little bits, and we transplanted them back on that we could find. And as I was planting them, I was thinking of him and saying, you know, Sully, come and visit me sometime. Come here and, 
you know, like a fish or whatever. And what was so beautiful is last, that was September, in October, Lefke cap captured this photo where there, you could see the fingers are all surrounding this amazing superhero. And Suleiman was a comic book artist, a Jordanian comic book artist who made superheroes for the Middle Eastern youth to have role models and people to look up to. So for me to have a superhero like a, an octopus, which is able to camouflage itself and fit through small little holes and open lids, I just thought it was like a really beautiful symbolic moment. And Lefke, who took the photograph, is super organized. I love her, um, how she likes to go through and find timestamps. We need more people like that. If anyone knows people, students, schools, she was thinking, okay, what did, the what did the camera capture? And she went to our YouTube channel and nailed it, so you can actually go watch it coming in and sneaking around. And we're also collaborating with students that have nothing really to do with coral reefs. These are three of a four or five person team at Olin College. Carrie Nugent's a friend of mine. I believe she's all about asteroids, but she brought in her students to give them an opportunity to go through our hydrophone audio data recordings. And they started to create a software program where we're trying to catalog, okay, there's all the noisy motor boat sounds. There's some fish sounds. Maybe this is a unique um, ocean voice we've never heard before. And they just started on the software program, but we had a great time remotely collaborating and hopefully we'll be able to use these hundreds of hours of audio data to actually create something of importance for our scientific and community research. And these are some other collaborators. I just wanted to share a variety of species that have been moving in. You saw how ugly, I, I think it looked so uh, just bleh, when it was naked and now to see this most recent shot with the urchin and the parietes and the, it's just a beautiful evolution. The concern a few people have expressed to me is how do you know that the minerals won't grow over faster, like overcome the corals? And it, it is a possibility like anything but this specific lettuce coral has been starting to smooth out and spread over and really take on, um, take over the form. So that was an exciting thing, the little crab. With the, with the diseases coming, we've lost certain, um, this type of flower coral here. We had about four of them. And again, I get attached to certain species sometimes. And that one has died since, I believe, but on the right, you can see two little new ones. This is just from a week ago, so that was a very exciting observation. And with all the volunteers and people involved, we have come up with a, a term for them. They're zoaistas, and this is Lyric Cox. She's She's amazing out there scrubbing the invasive algae. People say, why do you have to maintain it? It's because it's in a very polluted area where there's algaes and cyanobacterias and things that really do threaten to smother and wipe out the corals. So most of the projects and the areas require that we, <coughs> we clean them. And this is Penn Schrader, incredible new Zoista leader. She, she takes people out, talks about the project, organizes things, and it's a great project for buoyancy control, um, teaching. 15 students from Tech of Monterrey and Puebla came. This was impressive. Um, Miranda was her first dive ever after being certified came out and she, she brought all these students. We did a social service class. They got 100 credit hours. They learned to dive. They cleaned this, the pollution. They, it was incredible um, what, what Miranda, one volunteer, created with her university. I mean, they just learned to dive and then they were out helping. It was... Now I had mentioned before the fan that was flowing, that purple fan has been waving hello for day, for years. And just this week, I'm so grateful because on the 13th, Penn measured it and we have this photograph because just this week, a storm hit and we wondered, did someone steal it? What happened to it? It was no longer waving hello. and. It had, there it is, drifting down. The storm took it out. And 
I guess it felt really exciting to have all of us figuring out like what happened. Like, and here it was being planted. So with all the microhabitats we have to study, the next step is how do we increase the colonization of the corals? How do we make it really full of corals and try to amplify or enhance the, the rate? There are studies with microfragmentation, which some of you may be familiar with. It's where you take a mother or father parent coral and slice it up in a bunch of little pieces they grow side by side and they begin to fuse together. And here's what it looks like once they start fusing. And apparently, like I don't know if you're familiar, a, a living coral reef is 5,000 to 10,000 years old, the average living coral reefs. And for a coral to grow, it takes such a long time. If you can make corals that usually take 100 to 200 years to get to these sizes in two years, then we're onto something with the race of time. So right now, I'm working with Claudia Padilla, the, the scientist who was, um, I don't wanna go back a million layers, but that scientist there, we're working to do a research project right now where we can see, can we put some microfragmented corals onto Zoe and actually get some kind of like dual hit of now it's got the electrification and that, what do we get? So at UC Santa Cruz, I'm working in this lab with Dr. Donald Potts, I'll call him Don, and I've been on my own studying different forms, prototypes and models, trying to see how can these be scaled up and how does this process really work? And I wanted to share with you the, um, working with stage 13, we did time lapse of the process. So you can, oops, it's gonna go back, because I always go. So this is a time lapse of the electrified metal chemical reaction, and you can see the minerals depositing. It's probably enough but we kept going for a very long time. And it's better with music, too. Okay. <laughs> the corals here in the Pacific, um, they're colder corals. They're, these are cup corals that we're working with, the Balanophilia elegans. And so it's a totally different reproductive process than the ones down in Mexico. But I wanted to show how we're taking this species and testing on multiple substrates this particular, as well as those accumulates I was just showing, we're working with oceanite. That's by reef life restoration. And Konstantin Sobolev is the scientist taking all these different minerals and saying, how can I put these together to finally make a, something that the corals and the, the larvae are attracted to, more fish come to. And so tomorrow night I'm going with them down to St. Martin to do some, some duck. It's really exciting. We're going down to, with the science team to document how this particular reef that's been in the water since like 2018, how's it doing and what do we discover? So this is one, of, I'm just giving you a little like, okay, here's the research I'm doing right now. We have the accumulates, the oceanite. I wanted to try some stained glass, see what would the larvae choose? How do they behave and respond? This is what the little planula look like before they morph into polyps. Here you can see they're starting to land onto some accumulates. It's got its little tentacles starting. And Don has never seen before that little folded planulae and or planulae. Or, and that that was exciting that, you know, as a scientist, he has very specific things he's looking for, and then I have things that I'm always like, let's try this and let's try that. And so um, having an artist and scientist working together in the lab has been beneficial for all of us. There you can see two very young polyps starting to show their skeletons, and then on the other side, they're actually getting their tentacles. And then time lapse is um, the funnest. We wanted to see between eating, that's brine shrimp they're eating, how long until they would purge? <laughs> I 
I really want audio soundtrack of them, like, mm, 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 it's so delicious, I love this. They're like, oh my god, mm, mm, mm. okay, but so <laughs> then, the, 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 you know how earlier I was saying that the tropical corals, 90% comes from photosynthesis. Well, these are cup corals that really do eat, I think, a little more heartily. We took a shot every 15 seconds, so for the math, i um, not sure, it was like six minutes total in the end. But I just want you to get to see it, spit it out, because it's so good. like he's going to burp. Okay. I wish I could fast forward. There's, so the, the, the cup corals, even though they're individuals, they're males and females, they reproduce by sperm. And, you know, every one of those planulae was done individually. They, they start to um, glom on to each other and secrete and excrete their exoskeletons to grow together. And even the babies are eating. thing to me. I don't know. There it goes. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. And so, um, are any of you guys divers here? Cool. Anybody snorkeler? Anybody an artist? Anybody love the ocean? Cool. Okay. So we're having a workshop um, in Cozumel this March 22nd to 26th, where you'll actually learn to draw underwater but it's open to every single person who's interested in the ocean. You can draw or paint from photos as well. And the inventor of this aqua sketch, Mark Hagen, he's invented this way where you take a, a scrolling vellum and you can just keep sketching, live sketching, and scroll along. And then you'll scan the different images and have them so you can paint them on canvas. So the other cool thing about this medium is you can print it, so you could print whole maps of underwater areas. We're hoping to do some prints of Zoe so people then can go under and monitor and count the different corals. There are more live heads of corals in the area. I know sometimes it looks kind of like a desert right there, but you can go around and see other life. And because I was talking about education as well and the transdisciplinary aspects of this. In 2015, when COP21 was happening in Paris, we wanted to participate. There was a thing called Art COP21, and you could put your location on the map for workshops and activities you were doing. And so we put together a art and science class for kids to make a small version of Zoe with paper mache. We'd have a biologist talk about the corals, and then we were working with Oops, Gustavo Navarrete here is a great alabrije artist, and this was homeschoolers. I made a little half-size Zoe thing, and you can see his beautiful puffer fish. This little girl is awesome. Here's in process. We worked with kids with cancer in Cancun who just, it was a huge group of amazing energy, and some found things. It got to a place where we didn't do the animation like we had hoped. It's now on Cozumel Island being used for their turtle education programs. But I mean, what we learned from this is whether you're on land or in the sea, we're all connected by the ocean. And it's, it's, um, it's that we all belong to the same planet. And it's our responsibility to create the conditions for life to flourish. And these are some of the many people who have made this work possible. And if you'd ever, it's a little bit chaotic, but if you ever want to contact me, it's down there. And here's where you can watch it live streaming or see the Instagram or anything else. So thank you if anyone has any questions. <laughs> who is Zoe? Zoe Anderson was a young woman who died tragically at the age of 24 of carbon monoxide poisoning, a leak in her home. And she wanted to help save and protect corals and they have a Zoe Anderson Memorial Fund 
And so we got together, Chris and I, talking about can we add this online virtual aquarium and make it in her honor. And with carbon dioxide being our like biggest threat to the ocean with acidification and everything, it's, it's kind of this sad irony but that she died from carbon monoxide and then we are all kind of on the edge with carbon dioxide. <laughs> So depending on the size of the superstructure, have you worked out how much electricity is needed per amount of, of metal that's involved? Is there a ratio? There is a ratio. Um, there's a, a group right now, I'm not sure if Aki's in Germany, but who can take the amount of metal to, to figure out the, the electrical equation. It seems to be around 2.4 volts is a great amount whenever I've done them on smaller scales, but yeah, you have to do the math. 2.4 volts per how much? Exactly. I don't know. the that, that, That's not my, I bring in my brother-in-law always with my V equals IR. Uh, yes. <laughs> Resistance equals this times that. Any more questions about the process or... So when you guys put the structure in place, um, it, you didn't, like when you put it in the water, you didn't like attach any coral, they all kind of self-germinated on it? No, actually we do transplant, especially in Mexico, we're transplanting most of those. And that's what, I didn't explain really well that right now when I'm looking at microfragmentation, the idea was that we could take a bunch of arrays at various heights and places with certain species, put them close by, find a way to attach them well, and hope that then they really take over. Yeah. Okay, so that, that fan curl, you said, then did you guys attach it when it was like a, like a newborn kind of, and then it just, it just grew? We attached it when it, well, a lot of them are called fragments of opportunity, meaning mm -hmm. they're floating from being kicked off or knocked off by somebody, and so we find them and plant them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, but if you, uh, if you just let them grow by them, by themselves naturally just waited for them to kind of fall down and, and just kind of germinate on the structure. How long do you think uh, that would take? So in this location, I don't know when it will really happen. Those reef balls have been there for 14, 12, 12, 14 years, a long time. And there are corals on some, but a lot of them are still bare. And that has a lot to do with how toxic the area is, I think, because I've seen them in the Dominican Republic with big elkhorns. So I don't think we're going to have a, a great success in this area without um, kick-starting it. Now the hope is once they start, like how we have all these other corals that we planted, maybe the others will smell and sense that this is a good place to make it to land, to settle. But we have to give them the transplanting, it seems, to get them to, to feel like it could be a habitat. habitat. Anything else? Do these structures attract fish? Yes. That's so a are you seeing larger numbers of fish throughout the whole area, even though you don't see so many corals? Yes, you do. It's um, a great way to do fish aggregation. Like uh, aquaculture, people will use this specifically to bring in fish. And like that one scene earlier where there was that one angelfish kind of in the desert, you notice that once you put the reef balls, once you put this, yeah, it's, a, it's starting to recreate an ecosystem. So it's actually helping the environment in a sense, and the people who might at some point want, well, maybe you don't want to harvest the fish, but there's a good thing about it. Yeah, in Bali, they did, in, in the area in Bali, they, the fishermen were so upset by all the fish. I mean, the, the fish were coming to the coral restoration area, and they were upset. They were cutting the cables because they were like, we want to fish here, but they were told to go fish out farther. So then they created a bunch of structures specifically for the fishermen so that they could bring in the fish for them. There's a ton of information, and I feel like I left you guys without a lot of big things. You can make them different sizes, different structures. This is a very small piece with the hopes that we can integrate the Intella reefs with the um, electrified reefs with maybe some people's genetic research and try to see, like, how do you avoid also putting ugly breakwaters? Because as an artist and designer, my fear is the amount of, like, we got to do stuff fast, let's put a big ugly wall in there, and then we miss out on that, you know, nothing likes ugly things, and coral reefs are beautiful and they were serving such an important, they provide habitat for 25% of marine species, they slow the waves, but they never were ugly and I don't think that you put a 
big wall that's causing scouring and acting like that's really the ultimate solution. We need to clean up the carbon and stuff too. But <laughs> so, yes? Where I got into it? How did you find out that they might produce quicker or faster through electrolysis? Oh gosh, that is from the, when I learned about electrolysis was in 2003 at an EcoWave conference where Wolf Hilberts and Tom Guerrero were talking about this is a method that we are using. So I went to learn with Wolf in Bali and that's, so I learned from the inventor of it back in 2003. Was that from like a, a, some natural resource that they learned that from, or it just came out of the blue? He was, so it's based on cathodic protect, protection that like boats use, oil rigs use, and he was just taking cathodic protection and going the next step to say, we can actually create building materials in the sea. And as an architect, he was thinking for developing island nations, we're going to build houses and materials, pull them out, and actually create homes and, so that instead of people right now just taking coral rock and trying to use that. So that's where it started and then he started working with coral reef restoration and then, then I happened to witness it and get really enthused how it related to like I could transform my own what I do with my art. But yeah, it's since the 70s he has been sharing, I mean he was published with this information and there's this concern in science that does it really work, does it meet the claims and all of that to me is like that's why we want to keep doing some more research so we can see what is happening in every location. Thank you. So has anybody tried putting an anode and a cathode on the structure to form its own electrolysis? So you have a differential potential between the two rather than having electricity being taken to the structure? They do. They like use zinc or aluminum as a sacrificial anode. Is that what you mean? Like that? Yeah, they Correct. do. But the challenge with that is that I don't know that it works as effectively from what I've been told to get the right um, voltage or amperage that control that. But I would love to see more like a self-contained power supply in the ocean where you use the ocean power but not, they, they, there's ocean powers that are swelling, you know, swell fuel, there's sea cells, there's things that are so big, and I'm wondering, can somebody, it's such a low volt, can somebody take something smaller and create the battery and do that? That would be a great thing. Electrolysis is a way to desalinate seawater. So you're actually taking the, the minerals out and, and having them attached to the wire, but you're also taking out sodium um, and chloride, or and, and uh, yeah. And, and so basically, it'd be hard to do, <laughs> but if you could collect the, the water that is around that structure, it'll be slightly lower in salinity than the actual seawater near it. And um, I, it, technologically, it'd be hard, but I mean, all you need is a low C, low salt and a high salt solution and you create a, a, a current. So Cool. You, it's sitting there waiting. <laughs> I, I don't know how physically it could be done, but it, it seems like the water immediately around that structure would be slightly lower in salinity than, you know, a meter higher. So there would be your, your voltage. Do you have a way, I know there's, you know, salinity, salinity probes and different things, but do you think there is a way that we could actually be able to measure, with all the current and stuff, yeah, how do you yeah. can control your measuring to be accurate? Um, oh, I'm just envisioning some way to do a refractometer type scan of that whole area and you'll see the gradient of high and low salt around it. There'll be cool. low salt around it and higher above it. Can you come do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an engineer. Uh. <laughs> but somebody might be able to figure it out. 